Our scripture reading is taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I invite you to stand as we uh, read God's word. And we see a, a closing prayer of Paul as he writes to the, you know, he writes the last lines of the uh, letter to Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who, will, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Heavenly Father, as we open your word again, we just pray that your spirit will be in us and among us. Your spirit will teach us. For that is the promise that Jesus made. When he, the spirit of truth, will come, will guide you into all truth. Guide us to Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Recently, I've been reading a two-volume set called Jesus of Nazareth. And in it, the author talks about the Lord's Prayer. You know, the one that we commonly refer to as, you know, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I, and I was thinking about that this week, and I said, you know, it'd be interesting to unpack that a little bit further. Now, I don't think Jesus meant for us to just say that prayer over and over again. I think it was an outline of how we are to actually pray. And when we think of you know, the first lines of that phrase, that first line of that prayer, back up just a moment. The disciples had asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Jesus wants to teach you to pray as well. Jesus wants you to pray to our Father. Who is our Father? What does it mean when you say, my Father? How is God our Father? Yes, God, our Father, indicates there's a relationship, isn't there? A relationship. Our, he's kin, right? He's our creator. Now listen to this in Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6. Everybody have it? We're going to be using our Bibles a lot. <laughs> Deuteronomy 32, verse 6 says, Do you thus deal with the Lord? O foolish and unwise people, is he not your father? who bought you, he has made you and established you. So it's the Heavenly Father who is the one who has brought you up. It's your Heavenly Father who has sustained you. It's your Heavenly Father who has given you many good and perfect gifts. For James 1, 17 and 18 says this, Every good... And every perfect gift is from above. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Aren't we thankful that he's consistent? We don't have a heavenly Father who says one thing one day and changes his mind and says another thing another day. We have a heavenly father who says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Are we thankful for that? Are we thankful for that? Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be kind, a, a kind of first fruits to his, crea to, to his creatures. A, fine, a kind of first fruits of his creatures, sorry. Yeah, he wants to bring us forth. He wants to show the world what he can do. You and I are sons and daughters of God. 
who Joy had or has a t-shirt, it says, I'm a princess on it. Because my father is who? Is the king. My father is the king. <laughs> Do we realize that? Do we live as princes and princesses? Can the world tell the difference between you and everyone else? As we as sons and daughters of God, should we be different? You know, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We should be distinct, as, as Peter says, a peculiar people. The world will pass away in its lust thereof. Where do we stand? We are sons and daughters through faith in Jesus. One of my favorite texts, you know it well. Found in 1 John chapter 3. Where John exclaims, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on, bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Chapter 5, verses 1 to 5 says this, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begat also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we, when, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Oh, the world looks at the commandments and says, oh, it's too much. And they consider themselves a good person. What does God say? There is none good, no, not one. They look at his commandments and say, oh, it's too much to bear. I, I, I can't deal with it. His commandments are not burdensome. For when we have the love of God in our hearts... It will make all the difference, and we can love our neighbors as ourselves. He goes on to explain, for whatever is born of God, what? Overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcame come the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? He's our elder brother. Do we ever think about what he gave up to save us? As the song says, he left the glory of heaven. And he came to this sin-darkened world and lived among us and became sin for us. And because of that, we have been adopted into the family of God. What greater blessing is that? It's the hope of every child in an orphanage to become what? Adopted. All of us were orphans, so to speak. Orphaned by sin, alienated from God. And it broke God's heart. And God says, I love you and I want you to come home. I want you to come back. I want you to be where I am. Those are the words of Jesus. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. Having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. According to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. What does the word father mean to you? It's a heart relationship. We, we cry, Abba, Father. What is this word, Abba? Let's read in Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage, again, to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And he said in Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, Abba, Father, all things, uh, Mark, I'm sorry, chapter 14, 36, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And now, Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Abba. Formed by the lips of infants and betokens unreasoning trust. Father expresses intelligent apprehension of the relationship. The two together express the love and in, an intelligent confidence of the child. It's a conduit for a connection. God our Father has a name which he longs to hear from our lips. It is the Hebrew term of endearment closest to the modern English word, daddy. Very connection to the heart of God. With the loudest of cries or the quiet of whispers, it immediately captures his attention and ushers us into his presence. We can be a living, breathing picture to our children what it means to have a father, a heavenly father, who cares, who's there, who always responds. So I ask you, what's in a name? If the name is Abba, the answer is everything. The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Our Father also has a lot of care for us. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 6, 25 to 34. This is the great, part of the greatest sermon ever preached and is by Jesus himself, the greatest preacher who ever lived. And he's preaching there, is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And as we read there, he says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father does what? Feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Oh, what care that he has for us. He knows what you need. But what does he tell us to do? He tells us to seek first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. There's enough trouble today. We don't need to add tomorrow's to it. 
Our Father loves us. Our Father cares for us. Our Father provides for us. And you know, he pities. He pities his children. He has a sympathizing ear. Psalm 103, 13 to 14. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. The Lord knows how much we can bear. The Lord knows our frame. He knows what we're made of. And often we think, I can't take any more. I'm overwhelmed. But our Father cares for us. Our Father knows. Our Father knows. Jesus taught the disciples and taught us, our Father which art in heaven. It teaches us that God has a family of which we are a part. And we stop to ever think our Father in heaven. Sometimes we're tempted to do wrong. And we think of our Father. Just as an earthly father would be disappointed, our Heavenly Father is also disappointed when we fall under the power of temptation, when we don't come to Him with our concerns, with our worries, with our fears, with our everything that we can possibly. He's waiting with open arms to receive us. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15 says, for this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The whole family in heaven and earth is named from the Father. And Jesus, the good shepherd, said this in John 10, 15, other sheep I have. Do we treat our neighbor as a son and daughter of God? Do we treat those that are down and out as a son and daughter of God? Do we remember that God shows no partiality? Peter said this, in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So that makes us all members of the same family. When I come to God in prayer, we do not need to limit our petition to myself, our immediate family, but to include all God's family, all members of his church. Do we pray that his kingdom will go forward? That there'll be more members to his family? Sometimes my heart is heavy because I see that there are places where you can't even open a Bible. There are some nations you can't cross into their borders with a Bible in your hand. And there are many precious souls that, that will never hear the name of Jesus. Do we pray for them? Do we pray for our ministries? Do we pray for the voice of prophecy? It is written, amazing facts. We do not need to limit our prayers to ourselves, our immediate family. 1 Timothy 2, 1-5. It is written, therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, 
for kings and all who are in authority that they that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence for it is good and acceptable in the sight of God our savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth for there is one God and one mediator between God and men the man Jesus Christ rather than criticize rather than promote conspiracy theories rather than than share nonsense We need to be sharing the love of God and praying for those who are in authority rather than bring them down. It's a hard thing to do. Now, I'm not saying you can't share a fun saying or something like that. Don't get me wrong. What I'm referring to is there's so many memes and so many things that are attacking our leaders and conspiracy theories and all that of foolishness that does nothing to promote the kingdom of God, nothing to promote his great love, nothing to promote his righteousness. Let's think about the words of this petition. Number one, it excludes all selfishness. You know the story. You've heard it many times. Jesus told, you can be found in Luke 18, verses 10 to 13. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other a tax collector. They always say, nobody likes the tax collector. But this wasn't just a regular tax collector. You see, the tax collector were especially hated because they were usually a a Jew who was working for Rome, and, and they would collect the tax that Rome had ordered, but they would also collect a little bit extra. And the extra, they put in their pocket. They were thieves. And the Pharisee stood up. And prayed thus with himself. I imagine he stood up and looked up into heaven kind of like this. Proud of himself. And he said, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Extortioners. And he's probably looking at that tax collector. Unjust adulterers are even as this tax collector. And then he goes on to say how good he is. I fast twice a week wasn't required, but let's go a little extra, you know, so he fasted twice a week. He gave tithes of all that I possess. The tax collector, he was standing away. Would not even so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, Be merciful to me, a sinner. And from what I understand, that word A could really be translated the, as if he was the only sinner in the entire world. He went down justified. He didn't try to justify himself. He didn't try to excuse his behavior. He went down justified because he recognized what he was, a sinner. You know the golden rule. And by it we're made conscious of God's interest in others and reminds us the meaning of the golden rule. Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even to them, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets that the Pharisee had taken and went down and put his arm around that tax collector and said, God will forgive you. Let's come and offer the sacrifice. Let's come and let, let's, let's pray together. Isn't that what Jesus does for us? Isn't that what the Heavenly Father does for us? He doesn't wait for us to get better. He doesn't wait for us 
to clean up our acts. He picks us up and says, my son, my daughter, I love you. Let us go home. We see this paternal attitude revealed in life of the Son of God. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. You know the story well. They dragged the woman to Jesus. And Jesus knew it was a trap. For the law said you also dragged the man caught with the woman. Where was the man? Nowhere to be found. And these self-righteous elders who hadn't learned what it means to love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their strength, and to love their neighbor as themselves. So Jesus was demonstrating the love of the Father in this instance. And, and, and they, they come and they drag this woman. So the law says she should be stoned. What do you say? They're trying to trap him. Jesus said nothing. Just wrote in the ground. The Bible doesn't say what, it write, what he wrote. I believe it was their sins. Let's say one of those names was, well, give me a name. <laughs> Let's say one of their names was Matthias. And so he writes down, Matthias, you're an adulterer. And Matthias looks over and sees it, and um, a little lump is in his throat, and uh, he just backs away and leaves. And, and Josiah, you're a thief. And they know that he's right. For when Jesus calls you as you are, you know in your heart that he is right. There's no reasoning, no excuse made. And one by one they leave. But I don't know about you. I don't know if I'd want to wait for my name to come up on that list. They all left one by one and the woman's there alone. And, and, and Jesus asked her, where are your accusers? There aren't any, Lord. Says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Have you been brought to Jesus? Jesus said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He's waiting for you with open arms. Come as you are, just as I am. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So what Jesus was, the Father is. What Jesus is, the Father is. In John 8, 39, he says, I speak which I have seen with my Father. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Matthew 6, 30, he cares for you. Isaiah 63, 9, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Is this the picture you see with the opening words of the Lord's Prayer? Do they unfold you the deep and most significant relationship between us and God? Can you see the true meaning of God's family and his loving care? Does it put in your heart a hate for selfishness? can only do that by God's grace. Do you include others in your daily prayer? Let's look at a few other illustrations here before we close. In Isaiah 49, 15, it talks about a mother's love. It's asked the question there, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? 
Surely they may forget. Yet, the Father says, I will not forget you. Jeremiah 31.20 Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. He cries out, return to me. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We can see it in the illustration of Jonah. And Jonah had preached that the city of Nineveh, that wicked city, would be destroyed, what, in 40 days? And they repented in sackcloth and ashes, and, and Jonah went up on a hillside, and he thought the Lord was still going to destroy them. The Lord asked Jonah a question, is it right? Because, because it, it, it was hot, and, and the plant came up and shaded him, and the worm came and ate the plant. And, and the Lord asked him, is it right for you to be angry about you at the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow. It came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? Think of the prodigal son. He looked at his father and he said, I wish you were dead so that I can have my inheritance now. I don't want to wait for it. What an insult. His father gave him his inheritance and he went and spent it all in frivolous living as often what happens when we received an unexpected Windfall. Of course, he lost it all. And he was found feeding pigs. And he came to himself. What will it take for you to come to yourself? Sometimes we have to go through great difficulty. Sometimes we have to pass through the fire, so to speak. Sometimes we have to have a crisis. But all the while, the Father is waiting, scanning the horizon for any sight of his Son. And one day he sees his Son a long way off, filthy and dirty. And the Father runs to him. and embraces him, my son, you come home. What about his brother? His brother would have nothing to do with it. His brother was working in the fields, his faithful brother, doing all the right things in the right time. And uh, he comes and he complains, he says, you, didn't, you don't embrace me, you don't put a robe on me, you don't do anything for me. Father tries to console his brother. All that I have is yours. But my other son, he was dead and now he's alive. Come. Come to the celebration. It's a real challenge for us. Do we want to be like the elder brother? Do we want to represent properly the Father and his kingdom? Is our relationship with our Heavenly Father, it should cause us to love more deeply and more fully. It should make us better wives, better husbands, better sons, better daughters. You 
know, the Lord knows what is best for us. And sometimes it's really hard to say our Father. You know, Paul had an affliction. The Bible doesn't say what the affliction was. Some say he had bad eyesight. I think it was because of the stonings and the beatings and the terrible trials he went through proclaiming the love of the Father. But he, he, he says, Lord, I have this thorn in my side. And um, what does the Lord say? My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. The Lord knows what is best for us. Are we willing to submit to his will? What do we do? What do we do when trials come our way? What do we do when the, when the flesh is beaten? When, our, when the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, and, and we give in, and anger boils over. I've seen people argue over Bible points. They raise their voices and get mad when someone presents an argument different than theirs. What did Jesus pray for? Let's look at his prayer in John chapter 17. Verse 20, I do not pray for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one as your Father, as, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. For the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved, me, loved them as you have loved me. He wants to unite us. He wants us to walk in the light as he is in the light. He wants us to represent him and his kingdom. Oh, there's much more to this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and will continue on next time. Our Father, our God, dismiss us with your blessing. Continue to work in us and among us and unite us, Father, in, uh, in, in presenting your message and your truth of your love. And uh, may we leave this place, Father, with a greater desire to walk closer to you and in fellowship with one another. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.